uh, to catch up with. Um, so first, I would like to say that like Arlene Marison couldn't make it through um, because of personal reasons. Um, she promised to be back at Stanford for another talk. Um, so we're looking forward to help her. Nevertheless, we have wonderful guests, uh, guest speakers and panelists, uh, which I'm really excited about bringing to Stanford. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Dovon Dorfman, and I'm a doctoral student, JSD candidate here at the law school. Um, and I do disability studies and law, uh, among other things. Um, and next to me, there's uh, three people, this great three panelists. Um, let me just briefly introduce them, and we'll go straight ahead for presentation. After the presentation, um, I will make some comments. I will try to tie things up. I'll do my best. And then our panelists will also comment on each other. Um, and then we'll open it for uh, questions, OK? So um, on my left, there's Tom, Tom Burke. He's a, pro a professor of political science at Berkeley College and a visiting scholar at the Institute of, Government of Governmental Studies at UC Berkeley. Next to him, we have Stephen Rosenbaum. Um, he's a John and Elizabeth Bolt lecturer at Berkeley Law and a lecturer in law at Stanford Law School. And we have Laverne Jacobs. Laverne Jacobs, she's associate professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Windsor. Um, in 2013 to 2014, she's a Canada and Fulbright Visiting Research Chair in Canadian Studies at UC Berkeley. And I'm going to say it now, but I'm going to remind you later that on December 5th, uh, Laverne and, uh, and Steve will be both in a wonderful conference in disability and law at Berkeley Law. Um, so make sure to ours with me online, and I'll remind you again again. Um, and I think without no further ado, uh, we'll go ahead and we start with Tom. And each of the panelists will talk for 10 minutes. And then, you know, we'll move on to the next one, and then we'll open it. Okay. First of all, I'm, I'm the token non-lawyer on this panel. So I'm not going to my talk get into much into the uh, legal details. I'll leave that to my colleagues. I'm a little bit intimidated by talking about disability law with people who are much more steeped in it than I am. I, Duran was kind enough to invite me to this because I do research on the enforcement of disability law. And when I tell people this, um, it's interesting, and I tell them specifically on one part of disability law that gets less attention probably than the employment part, um, which is accessibility. Um, making uh, public facilities and programs accessible to people with a range of disabilities. When I tell that to uh, people, they say, oh yeah, I see, they, they say, I see so many changes being made. I see the lifts, I see the um, alternative entrances. So they point to that as a sign of the success of access law, which has been around for 30 to 40 years in the United States and really crystallized with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Actually, in one sense, it's a sign of the failure of accessibility law when they notice all these things. Because at the fundamental level, the goal of the disability rights movement and of access law is to make accessibility smooth, is to make redesigned surfaces and structures such that we wouldn't notice these things as extras. If you take the social model of disability, and I, again, I apologize because I know some of you are probably steeped in this stuff and others are just coming into it. The social model of disability, which is at the heart of the disability rights movement, says that, look, the way the world is constructed um, is normalized for certain kinds of people and doesn't work very well for other kinds of people. We gave you all these amazing chairs, which cost uh, probably close to $1,000. Laverne brought her own, um, and yet we didn't have to pay a charge. Um, so we, we make, we have, the built environment makes all kinds of assumptions about what a person is like, and it is a matter of simple equality to design facilities so that all people can access them. That's really different from the way I think an ordinary person thinks about this stuff, which is, hey, it's really nice if we have extra money set aside to do some stuff to allow people with a range of disabilities to get involved. It's a nice extra we do for those people. Um, so the social model has not really gotten very far in the sense that it um, has not changed consciousness. Now let me say a little bit about, you know, maybe one day your children, my children, 
will our grandchildren will look at the Supreme Court and, and one of their first thoughts will be, oh my God, all those steps, how barbaric. We'll see if that ever changes. Um, but that gives you a sense of how um, ambitious this law is. It's trying to change, it's shaking the foundations of everyday, um, of everyday life and it's shaking the way we think about things. Um, and yet the instruments to make this change are pretty rickety. Um, they're parts of the Americans with Disabilities Act, Title II and Title III, um, that these guys can tell you um, don't have great enforcement um, potential. Um, and then there's some state laws and there's some other federal laws that are used. And people with disabilities, when they feel that they've been discriminated against by not having an accessible program or facility, can bring an individual lawsuit. And sometimes they can bring, get damages. Often they just get attorney's fees and injunctions for it. Um, so I did a study with a colleague in a state that I can't name because I think I'd be breaking federal law and I'd certainly be breaking um, contracts with, uh, with the individuals involved and where we studied a range of organizations and how they responded to these access laws. For organizations, these laws are very challenging. They have this funny combination. On one hand, they can be very specific. The codes for what you're supposed to do to make your facilities accessible to people with a range of disabilities specify things like the height of toilet rooms, the grade of things, things you and I probably don't even think about, but that can be extraordinarily important. At the same time, the laws have a series of defenses for organizations that are phrased in very broad terms. Like, for example, you're supposed to make changes that are readily achievable. Well, what's readily achievable? And you shouldn't have to make changes that fundamentally alter the nature of your organization. Well, what fundamentally alters the nature of your organization? So there's this combination of the very concrete and the very specific and the much more broad, and we were interested in how organizations deal with this uh, combination. How do they handle it? And we found a wide range of responses. This was in a state, again, I can't name that state, but it's an area, that, a state that's um, more affluent than most. The region we were studying was way more affluent than most. And it was also an area with a lot of disability activism. And yet we saw plenty of examples of organizations that fundamentally violated all the access laws. And I'll give you one example, a, a nice contrast we did between two universities. Universities have been regulated under access law longer than most organizations, going back to the 70s, um, even maybe the late 60s. But when you go to college campuses, you'll see a wide range. One of the campuses we went to had newly built buildings that were actually in violation of the law. They had many, many um, places on campus that someone uh, with a wheelchair could not access. Um, and even some new facilities that um, uh, uh, someone like the Burn could not access. Um, and they, they, on the other hand, they had a disability office with a committed disability rights believer, but she was an insurgent within her organization and didn't have much power. She was kind of hoping someone would sue the university. That was how she would get more power. That was one of the universities we went to. Another one um, we went to had been sued. Um, and had a very strong disability office. And that disability office had a separate budget, it conducted inspections every year, it highlighted problems, and it had made enormous progress on that campus. Um, really, it was the closest uh, set of facilities we saw where people in wheelchairs, for example, were almost at parity with, with walkers, uh, amply. It was really kind of amazing some of the clever things they had done. Um, but so we're interested in why some places are like this and others aren't. Part of the answer is litigation. And uh, my colleagues here can talk a little bit more maybe about the litigation. It's interesting. Here in California, there's a whole politics around this. You may sometimes read about it. Um, it bubbles up in the popular media every once in a while because, because so many organizations are basically in violation of access law. You can pretty much go, if you're a person with a disability, and find violations all over the place. And normally that's not a big deal for a lot of organizations, except in California there's a special law that says that every time they violate a civil rights law, they owe you $4,000. And some lawyers have figured out that this can be a quite lucrative um, way of practicing law. And those lawyers sue hundreds of facilities 
Um, and that has created all kinds of criticism. Now you might think 25 years after the Americans with Disabilities Act, the problem would be that there's so many people violating the law. But that's not how it's uh, portrayed in the popular media. The, it's portrayed as these villainous lawyers, these greedy lawyers, are going after these nice facilities and demanding absurd things. And again, this is just a sign. Now, I don't know, for young lawyers out here, is this an area where there's an opportunity? There's certainly a lot of problems out there to be solved. Whether there's a way to develop a practice that doesn't get you into hot water culturally or politically, and also is self-sustaining, uh, I don't have the answer to that because I'm not a lawyer. And, I, and I'm supposed to have the answer. Because <laughs> um, there's a number of things I'm trying to integrate, uh, remarks I was thinking of making with some of the things that Tom said and maybe um, foreshadowing a little bit what Bert will talk about. And we really designed this to give most of the time to you to ask questions, although I'm feeling like, uh, you know, driving, like, sort of looking at these ways, it's sort of on. But, it's good um, for people with a left-wing bias. I guess that is the left-wing <laughs> bias. There we go. You know, on the points about hot water, it reminds me, one of the things, one of the most incredible, not incredible, that's striking about new construction, uh, there's a law school across the bay, there's another law school whose name will remain, uh, I, can't, I guess we're not allowed to name schools, it's called University of California, Berkeley, <laughs> which after redoing the building, including laboratories, still has the soap dispenser up here and the towel dispenser up here. Very expensive, right, to put, very hard to figure that out, and inevitably that's one of the things in new construction that you see. And the law, the ADA, how many of you are familiar with the ADA, Americans? I mean, that know it, not know of it, but know it. Okay, one of the things that it, unlike other civil rights laws, it had to, you know, it had to have some thing, it had to have some lead time, okay? We knew in terms of discrimination against African Americans, against um, Latinos, against uh, women, LGBT communities, it was like, end it, okay? Stop. Uh, go into the restaurant now, you can stay at this hotel, you can eat here, you can sleep here, you can be in this class. Disability was not an overnight thing because there needed to be some changes to the built environment. Taking stairs away, putting in ramps, putting in elevators, widening doors, what have you. But the law was, took account of that and there was a lot of lead time. When Tom says that in the year 2013, 2014, we're still dealing with some of these old issues, that, that should not be happening because the law was passed in 1990. So it understood, number one, a grace period before things had to be in compliance. Number two, there was a recognition that historic buildings were going to be harder to make uh, the access readily achievable, the term that you use, as opposed to new construction where there's no excuse, right? No reason for a stairs, no reason why the door width can't be the right way, all the things, toilets, grab bars, all of that stuff should just happen from the beginning. So the law was very commonsensical in that way, although it was still anathema to a lot of activists who said, this is about civil rights, why do we need to have, why are we looking at cost, why are we looking at time, why are we looking at um, all these other issues. And again, you go back to the model of the civil rights movement where being a, a, the blacks had to sit in the back of the bus, for the disability movement it was a question of getting on the bus, okay? And again, being served in restaurants for disability movement was getting into the restaurants, right? Uh, and then you end up with these silly situations where you have a bathroom that's ex got wide doors, but you get inside, and then the stall is filled with janitorial equipment, right? Or, or there's grab bars, but not enough space to get in. Anyway, this is a continuing problem. And although these so-called drive-by lawsuits have been criticized, and the California legislature has done a lot to make it more difficult for plaintiff lawyers, we need to remember that it's not just about getting rich quick chasing the ambulance, as we know in the sort of general parlance about uh, public um, personal injury lawyers, it's because recognizing that the government doesn't have the resources, the time, the money, the staffing to litigate all of these cases, it, it gives incentives to individual lawyers to bring these suits. And by and large, when we're talking about public accommodation, it's true, there's some exceptions in California, but under the ADA, it's about injunctive relief. What's injunctive relief? would be lawyers. Who's a one out here? <laughs> Only one, who's a two out? And three out, okay, you guys, what's an injunction? 
to stop stop doing or to do, right? To order. So the suits are, are about, they're not about damages with this California exception. They're about fix that building, fix that structure, do whatever. And again, the notion of, you know, the notion of the private attorney general, when the attorney general can't herself go out and make these changes or her staff, you need individual lawyers to do that, right? So that's, that's why the law was built that way, not get rich quick. Another thing that's hard for the public to understand is, well, why does my store need to be accessible or my restaurant? No one ever comes in here in a wheelchair or with the mobility impairment. Uh, well, number one, maybe there's a reason they don't because the aisles are too narrow or there's not enough room between tables. But the idea is you don't have to wait till uh, somebody with a disability approaches your particular public accommodation. The idea is because it is a public accommodation, although in the private sector, open to the public, nonetheless, it should be accessible. And, and, that, and that's why it's a hard concept for people, for defendants, if you will, to understand, or the general population. But the notion is you don't have to wait till someone wants to use the space. It's supposed to be open. And this notion of universal design, for instance, which has come about in recent years, is like every space should be accessible. Housing, uh, new buildings, and there's no reason to put those stairs in. So, so that's, that's one thing I wanted to talk about. This campus itself, um, when I, I teach a disability rights class here, and in years past, I've actually had students go out and, 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 and look at different areas of the campus and do their own kind of examination. And it's not been in compliance. There's been a lot of new construction here at Stanford. And Stanford does have a little bit of money to, to, to vote to things <laughs> like that. Just a little bit of money. Right? Um, so um, I think the other thing that's interesting about the disability rights movement that sort of uh, distinguishes it from the civil rights movement generally, and the earlier civil rights movements, is very much modeled on that. And yet, to this day, there does seem to be a disconnect between those people doing disability rights law and those who are doing LGBT, gender, sex, um, gender identity, uh, race, religion, ethnicity. People intellectually understand, but both sides are not always talking to each other. There really, there seems to be um, not always an appreciation of, of the issues. And I don't really quite know why, why that necessarily is. Maybe again, because disability is a little different than having to look at cost and change as a, as a, as a, uh, a prelude to, to, to making that social change. But intellectually, people understand it. And yet, I do notice this, this divide. Um, and as much as there have been a lot of crossover issues, immigrant rights and disability rights has happened, um, LGBT with, with HIV and, and um, disability, uh, it's come up in, um, I'm trying to think what other areas, where you've seen attempts to make alliances. And I think it's really important that those alliances be there. Uh, sort of along the lines of what Tom talked about earlier in terms of the um, disability right compliance people on campus, they shouldn't be the only ones who are monitoring compliance. It should be the job of everybody to be supporting disability rights, much as it is the obligation of those in the disability rights movement to be allies of other causes too. Uh, that, that, that are contemporary and face us. The more we have coalitions and the more we have people supporting each other, uh, the more we break down those barriers and the more we're able to kind of contribute to, uh, to more positive social change and to where people genuinely understand it and aren't just sort of, you know, toting the line because that, that's the thing to do. Um, I think, how many? Two minutes. 105. So I'm going to I'm going to yield to my to yield to the gentle lady, as they say in Congress. <laughs> yield to the gentle lady. Um, my colleagues over in Jacobs, and we'll take questions later. Well, thanks very much, Evers, to, to Duran and to uh, the organizers of the conference for uh, inviting inviting me here. Um, I really enjoyed listening to my colleagues' comments as well. I want to pick up on this idea of social movements that kind of, kind of has you know I think um, emerged in both of the presentations before us. Um, and what I want to do, coming from Canada, if Tom is the um, token non-lawyer, perhaps I'm the token non-Canadian, that's right, not non-American, but um, I want to talk about what's been going on in Canada, where we have ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And what I want to do is talk about a specific case that I've been involved with um, that deals with access to justice and um, the push to provide legal services, so legal aid, Persons with Disabilities in Northern Canada, one territory in Northern Canada. So just to start, let me set the stage. What I'm talking about here is, um, 
I'm talking about here is is um, a case that took place in the Northwest Territories, so one of the territories of Canada. Uh, a self-represented litigant had come to a colleague, uh, a colleague of myself at the university, and had asked us if it would be possible for us to look into um, the denial of legal services that um, she'd been given in the Northwest Territories. So she had a matter before a human rights tribunal. I know human rights tribunals don't exist uh, in the U.S., so I'll explain a little bit, um, very briefly, what they are. But it's a place where you can bring um, discrimination claims on various grounds, including disability, um, you know, sexual orientation, um, many of the, uh, the other aspects that uh, we looked at or touched on just uh, briefly in Steve's presentation. So um, the Northwest Territories Legal Services Board had made a blanket declaration that they were not going to provide legal aid to individuals who wanted to bring a matter before the Human Rights Tribunal. And so this, uh, this our client who had come before us had been denied legal aid. So my colleague and I took this on, <clears throat> my colleague being um, a legal scholar as well, but one who was looking into self-represented litigants nationally, um, doing a very interesting study in that, in that way. And what we did was we presented as experts um, before the Northwest Territories Human Rights Commission. So I told you a bit about the tribunal. They adjudicate claims dealing with various matters, including disability. Uh, the commission, though, does more policy work. So the Northwest Territories Human Rights Commission um, allows individuals to come before them and push for broader policy change. So in our case, we were saying, look, we think it's discriminatory if um, persons with disabilities aren't able to get legal services for a variety of reasons, which I'll get into, and uh, we think that you should you know, introduce in government, uh, in broader government, the notion that legal aid should be at least open to uh, persons who want to bring human rights claims. So uh, what I also want to do, just before I get into the, the details of what our argument was, is to tell you the outcome. So the Northwest Territories Human Rights Commission actually was, um, turned out to be quite uh, amenable to our claim. Uh, they wrote to the Department of Justice, so the Department of Justice is responsible for legal aid in the Northwest Territories, and they pushed to get legal aid available for persons with disabilities. What they took from our um, expert submissions was the idea that persons with disabilities often don't have uh, resources and they often live in poverty, et cetera. It's very difficult to bring a matter before a human rights tribunal. And they also picked up on the idea that many of the matters before the human rights tribunal actually are disability claims. So with that as a bit of an overview and giving you the ultimate outcome, um, let me just go into how we frame our analysis. <laughs> So we started off by placing our uh, argument within the context of access to justice. And uh, when we talk about access to justice generally, there are three wings that, um, that you see within um, government and theory. Uh, I take this from some work that was done internationally dealing with uh, inaccessible justice, human rights, persons with disabilities, and also has been um, taken within the feminist movement internationally as well. So we talk about the three wings being substantive justice, so the idea that access to justice should lead to some sort of outcome that, um, that uh, is available to, to those who are making the claim and that people feel that it's a, a just outcome. It also deals with procedural aspects. And for us uh, in the Northwest Territories, it was really the procedural aspect that we were most concerned about. So making sure that there is an opportunity to bring a claim um, you can get your claim before a tribunal or a court or whatever the resolution form is. The final aspect is called symbolic access to justice. And this is the idea that those who bring claims before tribunals or courts um, should feel that you know, they're being empowered by doing so, that the, the, the actual process is just, it's fair, um, etc. So we placed our analysis within the access to justice framework generally. And 
find interesting under the UNCRPD, which I mentioned is a convention that has been ratified by Canada. I know it hasn't been ratified by the US, but... Uh, you had to stick that in. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, some say that there, there's still some hope. We'll see what happens. In any event, I think that even if it hasn't been ratified by the US, the ideas that I'm bringing forward in our argument could be adapted in US states without the, the UN uh, as an overarching framework. But under the CRPD, there is an article, Article 13, that deals specifically with access to justice. And it essentially says that there has to be an effective way for um, persons with disabilities to access justice. And moreover, that accommodations should be given to persons with disabilities so that they can access justice. So what are accommodations? It might be, uh, we were arguing it was financial resources, but it might also be uh, an interpreter. It may be um, you know, a way of uh, dealing with the structure of government. So it might be training police and training court uh, officials so that they're able to work with persons with disabilities. There's a wide range of what access to justice uh, can mean in terms of accommodation under Article 13. So, this is the hardest part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I also brought um, this slide just to show you that uh, the Council of Europe is another place, there are other places in the world where providing access to justice to um, widely and to persons with disabilities, people who are victims of discrimination generally, so we can talk about other social groups and social movements, uh, providing access to justice in terms of um, legal funding is not unusual. And so the Council of Europe has a study that it's uh, done, um, and the last part of this a uh, slide is a quote from that, saying that the judicial system has to be accessible to victims of discrimination and the legal costs involved affordable. So, I think this is the next slide, I'm just going to go with like this because it's hard to move the slides, but um, our um, approach to access to justice talked about three ways that persons with disabilities um, I'm oh, sorry, giving persons with disabilities legal aid could be justified. And the first way deals with vulnerability. So there is a really fascinating study done in 2012, and it showed that persons with disabilities are susceptible to um, a wide variety of justiciable um, contexts. What that means is that you'll find persons with disabilities enmeshed in, um, in different types of legal cases more often than any other um, status group. So this is not just discrimination matters. Um, the authors of the study looked at matters dealing with wills, dealing with property, you know, all kinds of um, legal uh, contexts, and found that persons with disabilities were the highest uh, group um, um, represented or available or seen. One area that we definitely see uh, persons with disabilities um, where they figure prominently is discrimination. So um, I have a note there that says Canadian statistics. And in Canada, disability claims represent, represent the highest number of claims brought before these human rights tribunals that I was talking about. In the very last column of this chart, uh, where it says total, at the bottom of that, you'll see that 48.3% of all um, claims brought before human rights tribunals are claims about disability discrimination. That's almost half. That's across the country. There are human rights tribunals in all 10 provinces and uh, three territories. So, um, you know, we're talking about a massive number of claims. Uh, in the Northwest Territories, where we were, the second column at the bottom, you'll see that over half, 55.3% of all the claims brought to the Northwest Territories Human Rights Tribunal uh, were claims dealing with disability discrimination. And just generally, as you look across the chart, you can see some other startling figures. Alberta, 84% of the claims brought before the tribunal, disability discrimination. So there's something going on. And this is, I've shown you 2011, 2012, but I mean, this is constant. All of the literature always talks about the fact that disability rights claims are the highest uh, percentage of claims before human rights tribunals in Canada. I think I can skip this one, but it's just also another 
um, I showed you before, the Council of Europe for the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights also talks about how um, it's important to ensure aid to those who want to bring uh, claims in order to provide access to justice. So I talked about vulnerability, and um, uh, we essentially argued that because uh, persons with disabilities are vulnerable to being enmeshed in legal claims, and particularly dis discrimination claims, the type of the type that were um, available there, it's important to have some sort of support. The other two uh, arguments dealt with reasonable accommodation. So um, if an individual, a uh, person with disability, is um, bringing a matter before a human rights tribunal, um, one way to accommodate them to make sure that there is an even playing field is perhaps to offer uh, legal aid. We knew that this wouldn't be the case for every uh, every person with a disability, but the idea was that um, if the legal, unlike the Legal Services Board, which should shut the door to any legal legal aid um, before a human rights tribunal, our argument was that at least the door should be open so that people can apply for legal aid if they want it. And the final argument we made, which I can just summarize quickly, dealt with financial means. So persons with disabilities in Canada and around the world generally often live in poverty. And um, I'll just give you one statistic that I have on that. Almost 30% of individuals living below the poverty line in Canada are persons with disabilities and they're also unemployed. So in conclusion, um, this is uh, kind of the, the structure, the breakdown of the type of argument that we made before the Human Rights Commission in Northwest Territories. As I said, we were uh, fairly successful. We still have to, fairly successful within the machinations of government. And getting the Minister of Justice to move forward um, is the next step, and we'll see what happens uh, next. Okay. Um, thank you so much for everyone for their um, great comments. I'll try and make some comments, you know, about everyone. Um, and the idea and the word that comes to my mind after hearing all of them talk is the word access, right? So we have physical access with Tom, and we have access to justice with Laverne. And actually, access is such a strong and, you know, big word for me as also a foreigner, right? Originally, I'm from Israel. And in Israel, you know, I think access is Access to society comes even from, you know, having the right to have a family, for example, or have children, and to be really engaged with your community. And that's a different kind of access that you can think about. And I'm, uh, I was personally involved in a, in a case uh, with this woman who was struggling to have a baby through surrogacy, something that is not allowed um, in Israel for single women. Um, she went abroad, she had the baby, she brought it back. She, she brought the surrogate back to Israel and had the baby, and because um, of all kind of gen the lack of genetic connection to the mother was taken away by the state. Um, and this the story doesn't have an happy end. Uh, we went to the Supreme Court this summer, and it ruled against us um, on this matter. I think you know it's really important. But I think this case really illuminates the way that you know, and we argue that the way the policy is. Um, now implemented actually may excludes people with disability from the Israeli society, which is a very child-centric, in a way, society. And you know, having a child is the way is your ticket to society. Um, so that's one idea I had. Another idea that I had, um, and also went through, was um, the famous article by Fustenev, Abel, and Shabbat, which are three uh, very prominent Iranian society scholars. And he said that they had this idea of naming, blaming, claiming, which is the uh, process that uh, goes through a person's head when um, they want to make a claim. Um, it also goes to what Steve said and what Laverne said about the idea of empowering people with disabilities to come and actually make claims you know, regarding their rights and not treating that as charity or something that people might, might deserve only like as a charitable or, you know, pity, you know, issue. Um, another issue that I thought about mentioning is procedural justice. So my work um, also touched upon that. Um, for my thesis here at Stanford Law School, I did a project regarding procedural justice and identity, um, disability identity. And this really correlates with what uh, Stephen said, with what Steve said about, 
you know, um, the disability rights movement, the disability community being such a diverse and, you know, maybe different than other minority minority groups, it's not only, it's not homogeneous in a lot of ways. And it's not, and I'm not only talking about cross-disability, you know, through the social model that Tom uh, talked about, um, we regard the disability community as a whole, and we don't, and, but there are certain communities within it. There's deaf people, and there's people who are uh, visually impaired, or people with mobility impairments, and they have their own group, but they're still part of the disability community because they are um, also oppressed by society, right? And they have the same kind of oppression. And my study but didn't only take that into account, not only the cross disability, but also the way a person perceives himself or herself through the social model of disability, which as Tom mentioned, is you know, now the prominent uh, model to, of treatment for people with disabilities, or the older model, the medical model, the individual models, who see disability as a personal trait or something you know, that is wrong with the individual. And how does that you know, perception of self, which, which model do you really identify with, influences the way that you perceive and you experience um, legal proceedings? And the procedure, and the procedure that I checked um, as my case study was the one of retaining disability benefits in the U.S., which is, you know, very contentious and um, interesting. So that's another issue, you know, to think about. That, this is, like as Steve said, you know, the disability community is so broad and so diverse. Not only the cross disability issue, but also the way people are actually perceiving social movements, okay, and perceiving themselves in accordance with those social movements. Um, last thing I want to say and mention a little bit is um, the disability angle to every story. Um, there's this uh, prominent scholar in disability study, Joseph Shapiro, who said, you know, there's a disability angle to every story I tell. And I think that's very prominent and that's very true. I think there's a disability angle to every, you know, uh, legal issue. Um, and we talked a lot about access today, but there's, you know, um, you know, access to justice, and we talked about international law, and we talked about, you know, um, state law and federal law, but not only that, I think family law, family law obviously, like I said, has connection to disability, you know, labor law, obviously, um, and I think tax law even has disability angles to it, so I really, you know, encourage people to go beyond and find a disability angle to every, you know, area of the law. Um, last thing, yeah, um, last, last thing I promise is the saying by Jacob Tenbrook, which is the founder of the National Feder uh, Federation for the Blind, and he actually talked about accessibility and access as the right to live in the world, uh, which I think is a very strong, you know, statement to make, and I would like to leave you with that, you know, the right to live in the world for people who are inherently different, you know, and that also makes a disability community. Um, no more unique. So thank you, Alan. Thank you, everyone, for everything. Um, and I think we have some. <laughs> uh, and I think we have some time for questions, and we would love your questions. So please, yes. Um, I know the U.S. Supreme Court hasn't yet recognized disability as deserving of a heightened standard of scrutiny under the Fourteenth Amendment, and I wonder if you could speak to why you think that is, and if you see it changing. Mickey, you're the wrong to answer that question for you. We studied that. Um, the short answer is there was an attempt to bring the issue before the Supreme Court in the early 80s in a case involving the city of Cleveland, Texas. Texas is in the news a lot, not always for very good reasons. <laughs> see abortion clinics, see voting, uh, voting registration laws, see any number of things. Um, there was a residence for persons with intellectual disabilities, mental retardation at the time. And the, the part of the attempt of that lawsuit was to heighten the scrutiny that the court would give to viewing the discrimination against this group home, uh, which the city said was not, you know, the city, the section was not zoned to have such a residence. Making a long story short, um, the court came up with some good things, but in the process did fail to determine that disability, unlike race, sex, national origin, uh, gender, uh, was not a suspect class. And so partly as a result of that suit in the you know, say early, early mid-80s was a growing movement uh, to get the ADA passed in 1990. To, uh, okay, the court, you're not going to, on a constitutional basis, uh, rule that there's discrimination involved here. 
and, um, and, and have this, again, find a suspect class in terms of disability or intellectual disabilities as a subclass. Therefore, we need this new statute, the ADA, um, to bring those rights into, uh, to make them uh, part of the law, and therefore that becomes the basis of any claim. Much like the Civil Rights Act adopted 50 years ago, which again, race, gender, religion, color, creed, um, disability wasn't in that category in 1964, but in 1990, that became its own act. Well, it's uh, <laughs> as funny as the non-lawyers, yes, and I have the call to uh, yeah, yeah. intervene here, but I would just point out that this Supreme Court has not been particularly good for people with disabilities. <laughs> and you know, the, 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 I follow the ADA and the byplay between the court and Congress on the ADA, and you know, we had a um, kind of court correcting legislation in 2008, actually during the Bush administration, where they restored a bunch of things that the original progenitors of the ADA thought were in there, and the Supreme Court had narrowed it. And I think the problem that the Supreme Court has, and it's not just the conservative wing, it's the, the it's also uh, Breyer and, and O'Connor when she was on the court, was um, that they, it's just so mind blowing for them. They don't have a background in disability studies. And they go into this and they think, oh my god, anyone can sue under this. What, what's the boundary of disability? And we're so used to disability being a pretty straightforward thing. It's inability to work. I really do think that that's what most people still think disability is. And the ADA doesn't define it that way. And so the fluidity of, it, of disability as a concept is so disturbing especially in the context of worrying about opening the federal courts to a yeah, floodgate right. of litigation. Yeah. Um, so I think this is a real problem, and I think it's also part of the problem with the Equal Protection Clause, too. Actually, if I can step in, too, um, one thing that I wanted to say is that um, in Canada, we tend to move away, or the, the courts recently tend to move away from these various standards. So um, I think of just generally in administrative law, we have moved away from using um, patent of reasonableness, reasonableness, you know, et cetera, to determine the levels of scrutiny. So I think it's interesting that in our own panel and in the discussion just now, we've been talking about a lot of standards that obviously the U.S. Uh, still clings to, you know. So in the context of the ADA, we you know we have easily achievable, readily achievable, et cetera, and, you know, and how, how achievable is it, you know. Um, and then there's a matter of looking through gray areas, and that can often be very difficult. Um, we were just talking about uh, levels of scrutiny under the the, um, the Constitution, so talking about whether there's strict scrutiny, etc. So I wonder if the, part of the problem is, you know, this clinging to these standards. And I wondered if maybe either of you had comments on that. Let me just say one more thing. I, I really relate to that. In Israel, um, there was this process around the um, 90s and early 2000s, it was called the decline of formalism and the rise of values. Mm -hmm. So, and that's how Mautner, which is a prominent scholar, calls it. And it's also shying away, you know, from formalism and, you know, those, you know, boxes of uh, trying to put people in boxes or trying to put categories maybe in boxes and looking at, you know, values as a, you know, more prominent issue, more prominent value. There is a basic asymmetry with the ADA as compared to other civil rights statutes, which many people comment on, which is that the Civil Rights Act doesn't say um, if you're black, this covers you, or if you're a woman, this covers you. It says discrimination on the basis of sex or race is illegal. And disability law goes a different way. It says you're eligible to use the statute if you're a person with a disability, and then there's a huge fight over who is a person with a disability. And I think that's led to a lot of the, a lot of these issues. Right? Everyone knows in gender, a lot of the cases were brought by guys, right? I'm curious then in Canada how um, the courts have Uh, well, what we do have is a standard of undue hardship. So we look at, when we're talking about discrimination, we look at uh, whether or not there has been reasonable accommodation by what the respondent is to the point of undue hardship. And undue hardship is very widely known to incorporate some, um, it's a very high standard, some, um, some key components. So um, the court will look at costs, the court will look at um, 
issues such as safety to others, uh, whether there is, um, sometimes they look at union uh, matters, if it's a unionized workplace. So um, the idea though is that undue hardship is the standard, and it's very high, and it's a very hard test to meet. If I could just add, but again, you know what I said earlier about the, archi from architectural standpoint, difference between historic and new construction. Um, again, in the disability area, cost is something that's not an issue when you look at race, ethnicity, gender, and, and, and sexual orientation, and so forth. So it's one of those, again, strange issues of why should civil rights be based on cost, but there is a recognition in the law that if something, uh, typically in the employment situations where you see this, if you're a, uh, a small mom and pop employer, um, what can be costly to you is not the same if you're Walmart or Target or Safeway or something like that. So you do look at the what the uh, the hardship usually cost, the technological issue sometimes, operationally what's what's an issue when you're uh, evaluating whether or not the employer has a, has an obligation to accommodate the, the disability. So it's, it's a notion we see in U.S. law. And it also you know comes out to through the idea of right by suits, you know that, that Steve mentioned and Tom mentioned, you know the rationale for having accessibility for people with disabilities, you know and that's the rationale that um, people really like is it opens the door to a new kind of customer, you know, to a new range of people with disabilities will just come to your store, you know, and revive your business. But that might not happen, <laughs> you know, with, you know, small businesses. And I think that's, you know, a key issue here. Um, and that's what makes maybe Pride by Suit such a contentious, you know, idea of how much do you need to invest really in accessibility and how much we will get, really gain you know, from it, if that's the rationale that you're thinking about. And I think that's you know, the complexity and the political issue that Tom was referring to. So am I correct in the, um, understanding that in Canada, the application of the law is more individual, like based on the individual, instead of putting people into categories? So, so to give you an example, if you're looking at um, a building and construction, you wouldn't say, so was this easily achievable for the person? The, the test would be, um, you know, has this person or, or this organization tried to accommodate, reasonably accommodate to the point of undue hardship? So um, we take away those boxes of reasonably achievable, um, et cetera. And to get to the other part of your question, yes, it also is very uh, specific. And we always focus on the individual kind of, um, idea. So when we're uh, accommodating individuals within the workplace, we look at what that individual would be. Which I think is okay. But Steve, I mean, that's, that's true in America. Yeah. yeah, too. I mean, American law, yeah. disability law, employment and access, actually, yeah. is yeah. very individualized. Very individualized. Yeah. It's actually a problem. <laughs> Because it means that every individual, you can't say and go into court and say, well, look, other people with depression have gotten this accommodation or have been declared disabled, therefore, just come on. You have to make an individual case for your, that you follow all the individual standards, and you have to run through all the tests for your particular context with you and your individual employer and your particular job yeah. description. And this actually becomes kind of a burden. This, re this rehashes the class we had last week also yeah. on, on a com the notion of reasonable accommodation. And notice reasonable, okay? Law students reasonable, which we see a lot, the reasonable person, the reasonable accommodation. Um, that um, it is individualized, and it's also what's unique to this law. It's an, it's an interactive process. The you, the employee, with the employer, negotiate essentially to have that particular accommodation. You can't demand a specific thing, and cost can come into play. Uh, but it is, it is very much, and, and one step further in the education area, the, those of you familiar with uh, special education in IDEA, individuals with disabilities education, same notion as to what's appropriate for a particular student, the IEP, the I stands for individualized education program, and that also can be cookie cutter. All kids with autism get this, all kids with mental health disabilities get this, it's very, it's very difficult. Um, I have a question about people with invisible disabilities and what's being done to raise awareness of that because I personally sustained a nerve injury while working as a journalist and after that, you know, working at different places, I saw how little awareness and sensitivity there is. I've had employers try to like cure me and cast me up for a promotion just or ask me, you know, when I showed interest in the promotion, well, you have this like disability, why are you even applying? So 
um, I'm wondering what's being done to raise awareness about disability. <laughs> I mean, there's so many issues, right? Sorry. Well, I think this is this is very important because, again, I think um, Daron alluded a little bit to the um, the siloing, the, the cross disability movement. I mean, one of the hallmarks of the ADA and the legislation related to that before and after is it wasn't just about the blind, uh, war veterans who, in most countries, were the beginning of the disability movement, the people who were maimed in war. Um, folks who are blind or visual impairments, folks who are deaf have, or hard of hearing have sort of historically been their own movements and then later with people with mental retardation, intellectual disabilities, mobility, you know. Um, the idea was to bring together a cross-section of people with various disabilities, mental health disabilities, learning disabilities being sort of the two big invisible areas. And to this day, a stigma, I think even within the disability community, the stigma against people with mental health disabilities and society at large, well, that's, that's those crazy people. That's like a different issue, right? Um, and I'm the poster child for the disability movement is basically the, the, the wheelchair user, okay? Who, and, 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 and who's uh, cognitively not impaired and intellectually not impaired. And okay? that's kind of classic. People sort of get that person. Yeah. But it's a much harder group to understand. Um, not everyone has seen Kumbaya together within the community. And uh, much we'd like to talk about the solidarity and the alliance. So it's. It's difficult, yet to its credit, the ADA and, and, and the jurisprudence is very conscious of the fact, and IDEA as well, that people with um, invisible disabilities are also to be accommodated and very necessary to be educated um, and are entitled to uh, the same kinds of benefits. So I have just a couple things to add. One is that um, the UN Convention was um, a movement towards adopting a very broad definition of disability. Yes. So when you look at the convention, I was just looking up the, the definition myself, you see that it talks about the interaction between the individual and the environment, and it really leaves the, the landscape quite open. So persons with, with uh, invisible disabilities are more easily um, able to enter into the field. The other thing I was going to say is that in my jurisdiction in Canada, uh, the definition of disability within the human rights statutes is usually extremely vast. And I was just trying to see whether or not I have a, a, an example for you. But uh, it covers, you know, probably it explicitly says, that, you know, invisible disabilities. It's usually the definition is several lines long. And it's done that way. Most of the clauses are quite wide and open-ended. So that persons with uh, invisible disabilities and others that, other disabilities that arise in the law be broader. And I think, you know, with invisible disabilities, the, the idea of coming out with their disability is very queer, you know, scary. And it's really, really true, you know, with people with invisible disabilities with invisible disabilities. And there was a great article, I can, I don't remember who wrote it, but it was like in the New York Times, I think, about the idea of do you want to come out to your employer as having a disability, as having invisible disabilities, and the pros and cons of that, right? So I think it's a, it's a you know, um, such a complex idea. Yeah, I and mean, we still have a lot of work to do about that. Yeah. I had a question about the enforcement landscape, if each of you could speak to, in your respective countries, um, the relative strengths or focuses of, you know, whether it's government enforcement or in the U.S. we have what we call the private attorney general and private firms who take public interest cases or impact nonprofits. I'm not as familiar with what that looks like in Canada, for example, but I'd love to hear each of you speak to, to that balance. I, I can go first, I'll take it from you. In, um, in Canada, there's a new statute uh, that's been put into place in Ontario, and it's just recently also been adopted in December in Manitoba as well. And the idea behind the statute is to create um, accessibility standards. So to say, for example, that you know buildings must have accessible uh, washrooms, etc., and to define what these standards are pretty precisely. What's really exciting about the statute, I mean, it, it gives one hope, although now that we've looked at, uh, it's been enforced for years, now that we've looked at how it actually has been uh, enforced, we're I mean, not so hopeful, but um, what's exciting about the statute is that within it is a whole administrative regime of inspectors who can be appointed to go out, uh, inspect premises, bring back reports. Um, there's also a voluntary reporting system of businesses, et cetera, whoever is subject to the act to indicate what they've done. So that's the latest wave in Canada. It's called proactive regulation. And um, 
G are kind of working through it in developing standards and seeing what kinds of enforcement is actually, you know, being done. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think you know we probably don't have this idea of civil rights lawyers, you know, private ones working on. Um, I don't know. It's hard for me even to say civil rights. I, I say human rights, but yeah, uh, those issues. Um, I think there is a concept in the U.S. If I can say it, you know, as a foreigner who looks, you know, from the outside at it, that the courts see the idea of civil rights as being you know, something that needs to be more charitable or more, you know, volunteer work. Um, and they're kind of shying away from this idea of having a private lawyer who's actually, you know, getting money for bringing civil rights suits, if I'm not mistaken. That's how I see it. Um, and I think that's, um, that brings about a lot of problems going back you know, to this idea of drive by suits or even others. You know, I don't think, I'm, I'm not sure if, they, if they're getting, you know, this model is really something that the court comprehends, the U.S. court comprehends or accepts. Um, you know, the fee shifting issues about that, you know, are very complex nowadays. And I think that shows, you know, something, that there's a gap between how the civil rights uh, lawyers see themselves and how the court sees them. And they're, you know, yeah. If I can just comment on that, I think going back to Tom's point about analyzing how the U.S. Supreme Court treated the uh, employment cases at the beginning very badly with this fear that, that it would be the floodgates, that that also is really, of our U.S. Supreme Court under uh, Rehnquist and Roberts, is very unfriendly to civil rights generally and to plaintiff accessibility uh, to the court class actions we know have been severely uh, curtailed and, and using the courts as an avenue for um, expansion of rights, so it, disability sort of falls in that category the same way. And yes, human rights is an important concept. As, as Laverne indicated, we are, we are sort of infamous as a country for not ratifying human rights treaties. Uh, and this is one we came very close to the uh, Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities to, to ratify, we may yet, but we tend to think we know it all, we have the best laws already, we've got a good law, we've got some good case law, uh, but we should really be um, part of the world, we can be more part of the world community and be leaders uh, in, in that community if we were to ratify this convention. There's so many good reasons. Sim symbolism is one of the points you made, Liver, in your, your uh, list there on the Human Rights Tribunal in, in the Northwest Territories. Symbolism is so important, and, and, and that's where the U.S. really could um, uh, take a stand. The federal government um, does, you know, it really depends on who's president, how much enforcement is going on. Um, and, you know, they take leading cases in both the employment and the um, accessibility um, sphere. Employment, to me, seems not much different from other areas of civil rights. The remedy, the penalties and the uh, opportunities for private attorneys general are roughly the same with disability. The area of accessibility is, a, is kind of difficult because outside of California, you only have injunctive relief, so it's hard to make that private attorneys general kind of system work. Um, and I think that's part of the reason that we have so much, you know, uh, non-obedience uh, to uh, Title II and Title III. Um, and the other issue, historically, I just think that the, if you compare the infrastructure that was out there for enforcing civil rights during the civil rights thing, you know, the heart of the civil rights movement, to what you had following the ADA, it's just not the same. There's just, you know, Steve was part of it actually. I mean, there are state and national um, public interest groups, but they're few and far between that bring these cases. So there's just not a lot. I think that's why there has been so much focus on the drive-by attorneys. At least they're out there, you know, they're bringing these cases. Um, if we, need, we need to conclude. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, do you want to do that? Okay, yeah. Um, this is a quick one specifically for Tom. Um, yeah. In your research, have you looked at and or found anecdotally maybe um, any correlation between the, the number of like ADA violations on a campus and the number of um, physically disabled or um, people with a access effect affecting disabilities employed by that, that university's disability office? We haven't looked at that. But here's what I will say. We, and we didn't just study universities. We studied a lot of different 
In large organizations, having one committed person can be helpful, but that person can easily be isolated and can become kind of symbol, a symbolic response. You know, um, you can have a situation where there's a real believer and they propound policies and all kinds of things, but when you get throughout the organization, they don't really have power. So the things that we were looking at were things like this. When an organization is doing planning for new facilities, is the person who is kind of charged with implementing this law within that organization at the meeting? And to me, that's a much more powerful thing than just the sheer number of people on the campus in those responsibilities. So before we conclude, thank you. Before we conclude, um, I just want to remind everyone about the conference in Berkeley, right? Yes. Um, yes. On December 5th, the website. The website. My bio, yes. Which is my yes. So, yes, you, yes. you can look at the Google, Google Berkeley Google Law Disability, disability Canada. Canada. No, no, yeah. <laughs> okay. Are we it's seeing the national anthem before we? We'll see both now. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, I'm just wondering if you could all come and just uh, I'm promise that it will be a very exciting day for yeah. all of us. Yeah, December 5th, okay? Yeah. So, yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you for the panel. Thank you.